Hello everyone, this is Marita, one who catches lightning with the Path of Ish podcast, Walking with Our Shadow, where we share ancient indigenous teachings of remembrance, all so we can walk and learn how to walk a path of radical self-love. Welcome back everyone. It's Marita, one who catches lightning with the path of Ish. Here, sitting down, pausing to take a moment to gather all our parts as we welcome them into the circle. So let us do so now and just make sure that you have created enough space for yourself to listen to these podcasts, to these messages. I've spoken to many people who say they listen to them three or four times to let everything settle in. And thank you for those who are listening three or four times. Sometimes it takes time to get used to this way of teaching, oral tradition, because the message or the medicine is in the way the stories and the information that is woven into knowledge is shared. If you ever have an opportunity to sit with oral traditions, I highly recommend, no matter what the topic is, if you have the capacity to sit with it for a while, and if the teacher teaches it again, go again, even though you think you've heard it, it will always be changing. I've had students of mine sit in a quote-unquote class of the same topic for three or four times. And every time we go through the class, it's different because we are all different. We're all changing, growing, and evolving. Since we cannot stop change, and I know that that is something many would like, let us then find our own way through it with as much grace as possible. And one of the possible ways is to truly address the heart of the matter. Many times we say we don't like change, but if we start digging Instead of just saying, I don't like change, I'm resistant, we find out there's so much more there. Sometimes it's the need to prove yourself again, the need to be able to create worth and value for yourself in a system, and all systems are derivative, that finds no value truly in humans as people. Modern society, ever since the Industrial Revolution, treats humans and humanity pretty much as just another part of the great machine. I am traveling as I'm recording this, not at this moment, I'm sitting down, but in my travels, I have seen this even more, and have had the opportunity to sit with many people who are sometimes unaware that they are being caught up in the cogs of this machine that we call our day-to-day lives or our culture. And remember that when you're going out there in the world, or even when you're online, everything is an opportunity to pause 
and have a cultural exchange, just like the podcast that we had with Rose a bit ago. Treat everything like a cultural exchange. And if you do so, then you can be aware, you can be curious, you can question, and you can realize that your way of being or thinking, not only is it not the only way, right? There are many ways, but you can see what are the blocks for people in their culture when they're asking to learn from your culture. And that has become very, very present on this trip. It's perfect that we're going to have a sharing, a conversation about this topic now that there has been some bodies in movement. Travel for me has always brought an opportunity to be cognizant of change, cognizant of cultural exchanges, and I love it. It's hard, and it's harder these days to travel. I truly, truly miss being at home. But when my body is in motion, when I can't count on my every day, it forces me to be presently with myself. So anytime you find opportunities to get out of your comfort zone, I strongly suggest, and if they're safe, to do your best to get uncomfortable. There is so much wisdom if we allow ourselves to sit with our discomfort. I'm not telling you to actively seek something that's going to create damage to yourself. I'm not telling you to jump off a cliff. I'm just saying... Can you get out of your everyday habits and examine how your habits truly many times define your life in a way that you then don't know how to get out of? And you can start small, like instead of having that coffee in that morning that makes you jittery, why not a cup of cacao? Or why not just Ask your body what it truly needs instead of just giving it what you always give it. If we are changing, growing, evolving, so do our needs. Yet we operate out of habits. I'd like to now take a moment to take our three breaths and enter into the circle and enter into the greater topic here. So wherever you are, wherever you find yourself as you travel through space, consciously, unconsciously, can you come back here now and let us do so and let us welcome ourselves into this space as we humbly approach circle to hold us to hold all of these conversations, the possibility of these conversations. And so we ask the East, the South, the West, and the North, and the guardians of whatever tradition you come from to allow us, to hold us, to welcome us into circleness. So just take a moment. We'll take our three breaths to kind of clear and deal and let go. We take our three breaths in and out through the nose. This is the three breath practice by the path of Ish, which we call Ik, which means wind. Ah, so let us begin in and out through the nose, bringing your mind into this time, into this place, welcoming it. 
in and out of your nose, bringing and welcoming your body into this time, into this place, into this circle. In and out through the nose, welcoming your body into this time, into this place, into this circle, and just allowing yourself to arrive. And just continue to breathe easily, allowing yourself to settle and be here now. And at any point in this exchange that you find yourself drifting off, don't get mad. That's okay. Just take a moment, take your three breaths and come back. And because this is a recording, there is the luxury of even coming back to the recording, which in oral traditions, when which are typically not recorded, you do not have that luxury. And it's good because it's the luxury of revisiting a moment. So let us continue on more moments as we introduce the topic, No Man is an Island. Now, many people think that this is attributed to Shakespeare, but it was a 17th century English author, John Don, D-O-N-N-E, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly, that used this in a sermon. And I want to, we've heard it before, or many have, if you have not, welcome to this cultural exchange with John Don. And let's dig into the bigger part of this quote. The quote that usually goes on is, no man is an island. And this is the longer part of this quote. And please uh, ask for your patience as some of this is old English and I'm going to make my way through it as best as I can. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Now we've heard that quote many times and it is a conversation that no one is self-sufficient. This 400-year-old poem slash sermon, whatever you would like to call it, rhythm of words, which has a very different rhythm than the English that we are using in the present day. Not one is better than the other. But it's allowing us a conversation to remind us that humans are born in a way where they seek community. And sometimes that's difficult if your community does not support you to be okay with this way of being or thinking. When we speak of community, we speak of connection. Now this connection in this quote, in this sermon, is talking about a human-centric connection. It even says mankind. This shows you that even at this time when this was first spoken in the 17th century, that that society believed primarily in the relationship that was human-centric. Not one such as we talk so much about in this circle, where all the kingdoms around you have as much value, you are no greater or lesser than them. This should show you that humans have been human centric for a very long time. 
and that the societies that have been built that are human-centric have been around us and have successfully grown for a very long time. And the importance of this is that in society there are rules. In rules there are belief systems. We've spoken about how to examine our habits as a way to moonwalk it back to our beliefs. And the importance of this is to see and at what point am I at in my journey of agreeing to belief systems or ways or value systems that are truly actually taking me away from relationship to the all and all that surrounds me and instead continue to live in a human-centric way. If it has been happening for centuries and you are having a hard time changing your habits, know that it has been very ingrained. And so make sure you are kind to yourself And make sure you find help and find community that has a different way of relation so it can be a mirror to you and for you of another possibility. I'm currently traveling. I'm in in a place where I am seeing the cultural exchange, (laughs) or should I say the bridge between cultures, as something so vast that is sometimes hard to wrap my head around, you could say. And I'm in a region right now surrounded by beautiful, beautiful Aina plenty of water, and in a town currently known for its international draw of society and mind. So we're not talking here about close-minded small towns, as many speak of. But I'm here and I've experienced that this human-centric way is very much alive. That animals and beings and water only have certain value if it is something that you can hunt or that gets hit when you're driving too fast on a highway. I say this because the value system of connection here in this culture that I'm visiting is human-centric and continues to exist because people are still feeding the system and following the rules of the system. Although people have spoken of their loss of lifestyle because of the pandemic, their loss of lifestyle has been one of loss of connection, and that connection was human-centric. And when people had to isolate in their homes, those little islands, they did not know how to live without human connection. It is something that many crave. So this quote here, shows you that a society built with these rules when forced into isolation suffers because of connection. And when they lost that human connection, people went to Mother Nature to connect. 
But why does it take something global like this for us to recognize that as humans and humankind, we are not an island as well? Islands, in and of their nature, teach us about isolation. I live on one. And I live on a part of the island that is not very populated. And it teaches you about your connection and your environment not being human-centric. And on an island, your everyday lifestyle supplies might not be something that comes easily. For example, I do not have DoorDash or Uber Eats or takeout or delivery. That way of life, which people deem in many cities or here on the continent as an everyday thing is not a part of my reality. And as supplies and shortages to supplies increase, over the next months and years, my relationship and our relationships to our lifestyles will change considerably. An island teaches you that everything on that island is precious and valuable. When you are on a continent or in a place that has plenty, you do not value things. And I have seen that as I'm currently in a place surrounded by great lakes, that water here has no value. Not so much as where I will be next in a high desert where water is very valued. Or if I go back home and have to literally carry my own water, there is another value set to that, a different part of relationship. But why is it that we have to experience a loss or a lack for something to have value? Why can't we give value to everything that is not human-centric. Things are not here put on this earth to serve humanity. And it is this misunderstanding of stewardship that has led to this way of life. It is this misunderstanding and unbalance and ideas that humans believe that they are greater than anything, that leads to this imbalance. And if we continue living our lives trying to solve the problem of even what is happening in nature only for humanity itself, we will not shift the paradigm. We will not shift the potential to create something that accepts and allows for the biodiversity of all life to have value. We cannot put humans first in our conscious effort to quote-unquote save the planet because what we're truly many doing is just saving our way of life, saving our lifestyle. And that is the one thing that I've heard over and over about people reflecting about the isolation that they had to experience is that their lifestyle was interrupted and they did not like it. Yes, they had food and water, and didn't suffer disease or anything, but it was a lifestyle. People sometimes don't want change because they don't want to redefine their lifestyles. And more importantly, they do not want to redefine their worth. 
They have figured out where they belong and their worth has been figured out. They have value. And so when change brings about how you have to redefine value, many, especially if you come from a human-centric model of living, have great, great challenges. But we must remember that ever since the human-centric model or machine was created, that even though it is quote-unquote human-centric, the value of humans in the machine is based on their value to the machine, to the progress of society that is human-centric. Therefore, humans are only worth what they can sacrifice to the machine of progress. You saw this in the Industrial Revolution. And you see this in corporations where humans and their value is on their output and their efficiency. And that's why they get replaced many times by machines. There is something in this human-centric interpretation of society that does not allow for our true humanity. We are not infallible, and yet there have been societies created where the idea is perfection excludes humans themselves. There are other ways, though. And how can we then build our way back? What are the bridges available for us to get back to our nature? Island living has a way of teaching us about the value of everything. And as supply chains get shorter and demand increases, we will see that happen on the continent as well. But islands teach you to value not just the things you can ship to them for your ease of lifestyle, but how everything in your environment has value and is important whether it is taking life or giving life. So for today's meditation, I would love for you to find a place where you can be on your island, whether you sit in your car, whether you are in a room, or whether you are in a place outside, we are looking for a place where you can just be in isolation. And this isolation, this place, is your island for this meditation. If you are outside, I highly recommend asking permission from the land for it to hold you during this meditation and ask it specifically to be an island. Now for those of you who are students of mine who have medicine wheels or are in the process of, this is a great opportunity to go sit in your medicine wheel. If you are indoors, Look around and see if you have natural objects around you, even a desk. If your desk is made of wood, ask the nature inside of that desk, that wood, to help hold you. Now, if you're in your car where it's getting a little bit more 
challenging here because we're further away from a raw material. But many cars these days have batteries. And so you can go to the mineral kingdom who has conductors to help you hold this idea. If you have a car that has leather inside of it, then you can go to the animal. And also everything was made, everything at one point was either designed and inspired by something in nature, whether it's the aerodynamics of your car. Many engineers have studied birds and flight for this. Go to those kingdoms and ask, can you hold this image of an island for me for this meditation? And if you'd like to do this meditation a few times, you can do so in different environments and see the connection. You might think that being in a car will make the connection harder, but do not dismiss the power of connecting to the nature around you whether it has been manufactured or not. And so as you connect to your island, state your name, state your purpose, and ask permission. And as that permission is given, let us begin. Let us take our three breaths again in and out through our nose as we welcome our mind Welcoming it into this time, this place, this island, this meditation. In and out through the nose. Welcoming the body into this time, this place, this meditation. In and out through the nose. Welcoming the essence into this time, this place, this meditation. With all three parts combined, we humbly approach our island. And just allow yourself to settle into your island. Breathe regularly until you get to that point where you sigh or yawn. And just allow your body, your mind, your essence to settle. As you're settling, I want you to start observing. Now you can do observation by opening up your eyes and looking around. And I would go through the senses. What do you observe visually now? What is around your island? And as you observe these things, Can you be grateful? Whether it's the cup holder holding your coffee or your cuatro manos y cinco volcanes cacao. Whether it's the tree outside. Whether it's the desk holding up your laptops or computers, which represent the mineral kingdom. Look at how interdependent you are. And go around and one by one say thank you. Thank you for supporting me. And now take the time to close your eyes and listen. What are the sounds around you? And just if you need to take an extra breath to welcome the mind to change the way it is observing, just do so now. And just listen. And as you're listening to your environment, can you be grateful for how it is supporting you, how interdependent you are, 
If you're outside and you're listening to birds, if you're inside listening to the whirring of a fan, or if you're in your car listening to the sounds inside there. And now let us settle and observe another way through touch. As you're there with your eyes closed, I suggest keeping them closed. Can you feel the things around you? Whether it is the chair you're sitting in, the ground you're sitting upon, the air around you, whether it is warm or cool, if there's a breeze or not, and thank it for supporting you. All of these things on your island are supporting you. And as you take time to be grateful, you can recognize how abundant your life is. Even if you're sitting in a car, not everyone has a car how it gets you to the places that it needs to get you. Maybe it's not the car that you want or the latest model. Maybe you're having to fix it all the time, but still not everyone has a car. Thank it for getting you from point A to point B. And if you're still having trouble with a car, think about the rubber how it was inspired by rubber trees and the connection to the plant kingdom. And all of a sudden, what you have is a tree on wheels almost, supporting your movement. And with all of these observations... As you exchange gratitude with them, as you recognize your interdependence, as you recognize how all of these things support you in your abundance, in your everyday, how Mother Nature is supporting us all the time, As more and more gratitude is exchanged, you should feel into your body. Does it feel more relaxed? Do you feel more expansive? Do you feel more connected? Less alone? And with that, thank the space for holding you and giving you this opportunity to connect to your island. Islands teach us our interdependence with everything on it that supports us. And with that gratitude of that support, start coming back. Take your three breaths. Hmm. Give thanks and release the island back to itself. And with that... We bow to the circle, to the island, to all who have held us, to even the imagery of island, of land, of Aina, and how it has taught us that interdependence is not just about human connection. We are no greater or lesser than any living thing. Whether it has been taken an inspiration from nature or manufactured with 
something that was natural. We are always supported by our land inside of us and outside of us. And the more that we can make connection to this, the more we can see the importance of living in balance and living in gratitude as a way of interdependence. And with that, I bow to you in gratitude for taking this time to all my teachers, past and present, Shade. I hope that you have a week where you can do this meditation and take moments to observe your islands, whether it be your desk, your car, your seat on the bus and the subway as you are in nature, or even if your island is just your cup of cacao, how much does it hold you? And from there, we can start being sustainable as a way of coexisting in deep relationship with all that nurtures us. And if we can do that, possibly we can start shifting our way of being to create more balance as we are grateful for all. Once again, it is with deepest gratitude that I bow to you for joining me on this podcast, this episode, this circle, this platica, this meditation, this remembering. I hope that you have stayed curious. I hope to see you in the circle again next week. So make sure that you like or follow. Until then, may you be blessed with abundance of peace and radical self-love.